Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have Francis Jakubek as tonight's guest speaker. speaker. Francis graduated with a degree in photography from the New England Institute of Art in 2009. She is currently the director of exhibitions and operations at Bruce Silverstein Gallery and a past associate curator of the Griffin Museum of Photography in Massachusetts. Her photographs have been exhibited at the Southern Contemporary Art Gallery in Charleston, Filter Space Chicago, Camera Commons in Dover, New Hampshire, and the Hess Gallery at Pine Manor College. She has, a, she has been a guest writer for Don't Take Pictures, Diffusion Magazine, and four artist publications. She has served as a panelist for the Massachusetts Cultural Council's Photography Fellowships and juror for exhibitions such as Defense and PDN's The Curator Awards. Um, what a resume doesn't say, and I'll say it myself, is that uh, Frances is talented, open, down to earth. And um, she's the kind of person that makes our industry a more welcoming place, a more sustainable place, and we are thrilled to have her here tonight. So welcome, Frances. Wow, that was very nice. Um, thank you, SVA, for having me, and um, Jaime for inviting me. Um, a few housekeeping things. This is the mic that runs around for the video. Um, so if you have a question or something you want to say, make a signal so we can run this microphone to you because there's nothing worse than editing sound. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Um, I was a bit unsure what I would talk about tonight, um, but it was put in the announcement so beautifully um, that I would present an overview of the different worlds she inhabits within the photography field and the richness of their overlapping. So that's a really lovely say, way to say um, how I act as an artist, as a administrator, as um, a curator, and somebody who um, bases my whole life around this medium. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, really the way to have a career in a specific art field is because you're completely obsessed with it on every single level. Um, so starting with that, uh, I think it was I was age 10 or so, and my parents asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And I think it was like the same year as the Tamagotchi, um, but I asked my parents for four very specific Norman Rockwell prints. Um, so it's funny to think about that selection process um, I had as a kid and how I identified with this image um, and the act of storytelling at such a young age. So it's funny <laughs> to, to look at these now and how they reflect kind of on my, on my current life um, and um, influence the way I think about uh, storytelling and you know, this, the, the realism of, of Norman Rockwell. Um, and also when I was young, I was thinking, I was, it was fun to dig way back into a history of, um, what's that, um, influences on me and Post Secret. Uh, does anybody remember these books that came out? They were mailed in like confessions. So there were a lot of times they were um, photo based and um, these, these were really early influence on me. So I was making selections, and the ones that I chose for this slideshow resonate m more with me you know, now. Um, but when I was young, it, there was a lot of uh, posts about people, you know, they were going through their parents getting divorced, and it was really relatable to me. And um, no matter what age you are looking through these kind of confessionals, uh, you'll always find a way to relate um, and, you know, the reason we make confessions is, is because we need to. Um, so here's another one of these, and they're all anonymous, and there's something um, really special to that, because if you're not signing your name on something, the kind of information you'd be willing to give, the vulnerability you're <coughs> allowing yourself to feel um, is on a completely different level. Um, oh, God, this one, like, it, it makes me uh, nervous. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to keep going through just like really early stages of my exposure to photography. Um, 
so I took a photo class in high school. It was a film and darkroom class, and I had a really hard time with the technical aspects of stuff. I was really hung up on the assignments of, um, you know, getting the waterfall effect of moving water. And I remember I like went back to this space behind my house. I lived like kind of in the woods growing up, and I fell in this waterfall like five times just trying to get the the exposure right. And it was really really frustrating for me. And I was I was really bent on getting the technical aspects of it correct. So when, um, I don't even remember if that image ever happened, um, but this was the first picture that um, felt like I had done something technically correct. And watching this develop in the dark room, it was the first time I really felt like the magic of it. You know, it's, it, that the first moment in photography where you're like, oh, I, I'm never going to feel this feeling <laughs> ever again. I'm looking at this slide now, and it's like, wow, it's still doing that for me. And later, how it became um, like a really important picture for the familial aspect of it. So my brother is driving this um, Jeep, and we'll talk about him a little bit um, more later, but how an image at one time felt so important to me in terms of um, a, a, a technical challenge that I defeated, um, really the emotional aspect of it is what has, um, has lived on since then. And then also in my high school class, my friend Mark, my, like one of my closest friends in my life, we had an assignment that we had to hand color a photograph, and I don't have his now, but um, you know, I brought in a, a cute picture of my mom when she was little, it's a black and white, and I was you know, making her rosy cheeks, it's all very cute. And he brings in a picture of a classroom, a bunch of like small children, all at different desks, and he paints the entire thing brown, and then like erases their face. So they're like these little like ghostly kids sitting in a classroom. And I was like, Mark, I was like, what are you doing? I was like, what is this? It's so weird. And he's like, he's like, yeah, but it makes you feel something, mm -hmm. right? And that was really um, the beginning of the capacity of photography that it's such a like a concrete medium we want a photograph to be a truthful document that the, here was something that was manipulated in a way that was like gave me the creeps and I was so excited by that um, so then I um, was making my decision to go to to go to college and I originally um, oh so in high school I worked for the school newspaper and the yearbook, so I did a lot of imaging. I learned InDesign and Photoshop when they were like really still pretty clunky. Um, I look at the yearbook now and we have like the cutouts and everything has like jagged little angles on people's faces, but um, I thought I wanted to study journalism and you know incorporate the photographic aspect of it. So I went to the University of Connecticut originally to be a journalism major, and I remember my first class that was like a literary class um, based in my major was over 300 students and the professor stood at the front of the class and he's like, he's like, there's a lot of people in here. He's like, I'm probably not going to learn your name. And I was like, oh no, I, was, I don't really want to learn anything from somebody who would address a class like that. Um, so then I had a slam poetry class at UConn and I was like, okay. And I asked, I was like, can I incorporate photography and she looked at me and she was like that doesn't really make any sense and I was like oh okay <laughs> oh, I just I just really want to talk about photos um, so then I had art history class and I was like okay everything's gonna be fine um, and if you've ever been to Yukon it's a massive campus and the art department was in like the south part and I was in Hilltop which is what it sounds like um, and art history the professor never showed up on the first day. So, you know, they, they dismissed us properly, and I remember walking across campus like in the rain. I was like, I hate this place. And I called my, I called my mom, and I was like, hey, I was like, remember that, that art school I did the summer program at in Boston? I had done like a small, you know, week-long workshop uh, with Thomas Gustanis, who will continue to be a major person in my life. Um, and we called the school and I had like pretty decent grades and they were like, yeah, okay, sure. So <laughs> I got into, got into this program um, 
pretty quickly. I had gotten into the Art Institute in San Francisco first, so it was like technically the same um, school. So I was picked up from Boston, or I picked up from Yukon, went up to Boston, took my placement tests, and I remember my dad still jokes with me now where he's like, he's like, Francis, you came up to me and you were like, yeah, these are my people. <laughs> you know, he was, he was right. Uh, I was right. And um, so then I came back to Connecticut for a weekend and then um, I started school in Boston at the New England Institute of Art, um, which was a really small program. It doesn't even exist anymore, actually. Um, but the teachers that were there were the reason that it was what it was for me. Um, so this is a Gustave Le Gray, um, which I saw in real life a couple years ago. And I, I, it was at an art fair, and I visited it every single day of the fair. And um, the gallery owner was like, he's like, do you want to know the price? And I was like, just like please don't even tell me. Um, and I'm not even going to say the number now. Um, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really anticipate being so excited about the history of photography. So these were my really early classes at the school. Um, and I remember I had a teacher in high school, Mr. Minnelli. I asked him, I was like, why do we need to learn all of this stuff? You know, it's like you're learning dates and events and all these like test taking uh, pieces of information. And I'll never forget, he said to me, he's like, we're teaching you the tools and how to be receptive to information. And I was like, well, you know, like, okay. <laughs> I'll take that. So it didn't take until I cared about something that you retain any of this. Um, so this is a Henry Peach Robinson, um, 1858, where this would be a complex picture to take to create now. And it's a composite. Um, so all of these are different frames. Um, and I was fascinated by um, the, the, the labor that went into making a photograph like this. And same with Gustave Le Gray, that these are combination prints. And people were like, oh, it's witchcraft. Like, he's got the exposure for the sky and the exposure for the sea. And I just kind of love the, like, the, like, the voodoo about making pictures. I got excited about these kind of um, manipulated, magical things. It's, it always comes back to the, to the magic. Um, like this really simple Frederick Evans uh, from 1903 is, is I don't know, it's perfect for me. So I have these photographs that have just stayed in my mind forever and kind of have influenced me on a really um, a, a base level. Um, and Brigman, oh man. Um, so I was so taken with these images and um, I'm not sure if this one is a self-portrait, but she, so from 1912, you know, the nude female in a landscape being created by a female. Um, so Anne Brigman still every single day I think about her and um, the work that she put out into the world, and it's, it influences me um, daily. And it um, really references, uh, the, you know, looking at these, like the processes it before, during, and after wars that have happened during all these people's lives and what that imagery looks like. Um, you know, different perspectives of Rachenko was a big, uh, was a big one for me. Um, E.J. Belloc, there's actually a show of these opening on Friday night that I'm super excited for, nice Valentine's Day date uh, with uh, E.J. Belloc's Storyville portraits. Um, and there's a funny story with these where um, they were found after his death, Lee Friedlander took them, right, and made, made the prints. Um, but all of the, all, they were either wearing masks or their faces were scratched out in the, in the printing process. And it's this long question of who did the scratching. And, you know, I feel like they're presented with, you know, in, a, in kind of a respectful way. Like, I, I look at these and I don't feel offended by, you know, there's some projects I've seen in the world where it's, it, well, of course, um, they're really I exploitive. And I, these never made me feel like that somehow. Um, uh, this self-portrait by Bayard. So he um, was, it was working on um, this positive print process at the same time that Daguerre was, um, was coming to light. And so this is a really early staged photograph, um, too, of you know, self-portrait as a drowned man. And I found a quote, or he, it was inscribed on the back. He's like, the government, which has been only too generous <coughs> to Monsieur Daguerre, 
has said it can do nothing for Monsieur Bayard, and the poor wretch has drowned himself. And it's just the drama of it all, the staging of it all, that was such a huge influence on me. But it was about the chemistry. So this is like the early stages of photography even becoming a thing, a tangible thing. Um, so throughout this, I'm going to mix in pictures that I've made along the way of like these different like s school times. Um, so this is a, a picture I made when I was like 17, um, my first like serious kind of self-portrait um, that looking at it now is kind of like the establishing of the style that I would shoot in until uh, till today. So I look like around this room and all the different uh, symbols and references of um, home and family are present in a way that meant something different at the time that I took it. Um, but is, is even more major for me now. So in school, obviously, I'm exposed to Cindy Sherman's untitled film stills for the first time, and I, you know, I'm losing my mind, right? <laughs> These are um, self-portraits that she, she has made. Um, a huge influence in me on like, considering identity and our, our power of portrayal. So she had these different um, scenes that she had set up that could be pulled from um, any different kind of movie. And it's the same person repeated, which uh, was a Kickstarter for me in thinking about a self-portrait project that would last my lifetime. Um, so that's, that's my goal there. Um, this portrait of Lee Miller, um, who is oftentimes pinned as Man Ray's muse. Um, she was making photographs on the war front. She was in completely t terrible, difficult situations. Um, and this is her in Hitler's bathtub. Um, and it speaks to so many levels of um, like power, sex, gender, and atrocity. Um, but this, this, this feminine quality too, I think the actual picture was it was photographed by a man, but the fact that she would get in that bathtub and the performance of it all um, shook me. Um, Nikki S. Lee, who put herself into a really performative role, um, and uh, similar to Cindy Sherman, where she could um, she could melt herself into different scenarios, different um, races. A lot of times, she would change, you know, her makeup to. Um, to look like she was really part of it. And you know, there's an awkwardness to a lot of these pictures that is so relatable. Um, it's, it's cool to look at the artists that have influenced me way back when and um, the selections I make from that today. Um, wait, don't not skip Carrie Mae Weems, uh, Francesca Woodman, Woodman, forget it. She was so close to my age that when I was learning about her that she was when she was making these pictures. And I felt so closely aligned, um, and it opened up a whole new world of uh, what images could be. Um, OK, so here's another self-portrait from early college times. Um, and in the picture with me is a portrait of my grandmother, who <laughs> my number one story I remember about her. When I was young, I was showing her pictures of a um, of a, a dance, like a high, a high school dance. And she was like, Francis, she's like, I don't understand why you smile in all of your pictures. She's like, you don't look very good when you smile. I was like, okay, okay thanks, Grandma. <laughs> you know? And that obviously has stayed with me forever. Um, but it gave photography this sort of like sinister capability. So I made this portrait with her obviously not smiling portrait. Um, and um, it, be, you know, it, it became about the, the symbols. Um, so also in school, I feel like this is important to talk about. Um, my teacher, Molly Lamb, she arranged for us to, oh, Molly, um, start a photography program at a charter school in Hyde Park, which was like a very militaristic school. You know, these kids were learning Latin, and they couldn't talk during lunch. And it was, very, it was a very serious atmosphere. And a lot of the kids were making images about confinement. I think the school was an old fallout shelter, so they were taking pictures like in the bars. And it really opened up my eyes for me to see photography work as um, 
something that people really need, a creative outlet that they wouldn't really have otherwise. Um, so I remember that program grew from about seven students to like 30 the next year, you know, because they were all coming back with prints and it was, it was a major thing um, to witness and I, I felt really moved by um, bringing, bringing um, that into these kids' lives. Um, so this picture, um, you know, it was kind of in conjunction with the studio classes I was taking. I worked with the Boston Living Center, uh, which was a space for people living with HIV. And it was a, um, the BLC, they offered meals, like therapy, activities, and a pharmacy, which was major. Um, so I worked with their marketing department. And um, the goal was to make photographs that emphasize, like, the living aspect of the mission. So I had this really beautiful exposure to this community that otherwise um, I, I, would, I wouldn't have been a part of. And it was, it was a huge eye-opener for me um, to witness the way other people lived. I had a really privileged life. Um, and these people had made such a huge impact on me on just sitting down and talking, um, you know, hearing people's stories and how the human-to-human -human aspect is like really the most um, important part of all of this. Um, okay, so back to school, John O'Reilly. I'm just going to go through pictures that I absolutely adore and have since the minute I saw them. Um, Pell Katz, who was taking a different approach to what photography was. Um, I actually connected with him later in life, and I have a print of this, and on one of the sides of it is actually his hardwood floor. So he was creating this structure, you know, this collage with all the pins in it, and then he was putting it on his floor to take a picture of it. So this idea of photography as, um, as a means of reproduction, we can talk about Walter Benjamin for a whole other um, day, but um, it was bringing it to its material nature and it changes like the landscape and uh, the capability of a photograph. John Stesiker, I love these every single time I look at them. Um, Kenneth Josephson, who uh, also has a show in town right now, and it, I feel like he's like a real photographer's photographer. Um, so, you know, you make jokes about process and what, what the camera is, um, and crossing the line into surrealism, which brings us to my favorite guy. Um, so, Magritte really changed the way that I think about art and our, our, yeah, sorry, so deep, um, the way we, with the way we digest things. Um, so it's, you know, with the thing we, about the object and how it's represented and the language that we apply to something and how often we trust when there's words associated with something. So I became really fa fascinated with the idea of captioning um, and how far you could push a caption um, and I think, like, you know, thinking about this now and the, um, when we're presented with an image with not much more evidence otherwise, you know, you're hearing from the same author all the time. It's, it's what's happening politically right now. It's like we're, uh, at, um, we're given the same information from usually like the same couple sources. And when you're only exposed to certain information, that's, that's all you're going to know. So that's happening in different pockets of um, the country right now, the world, because um, if, you're, you're, if you're presented with something that this is something, this is not a pipe, this is a, a, a painting of a pipe. Um, so this was the beginning of um, finding, finding the challenge of language and imagery. Uh, Barbara Kruger, she's you know, creating images that demand a response. Um, and Dwayne Michaels, who's also speaking tonight, I think, at SBA, and that, you know, it's I'm like <laughs> mad that I can't be at it. Um, but he's, you know, he's referencing psychology, and these are pictures that you have to slow down and spend time with, and typically they're really funny. Uh, this was just on view at the Morgan, um, and he's had this intense narrative that, um, you know, really plays on photography too and how the scale of something could be so deceiving, but it's all about how it's presented. Um, Gerhard Richter, um, 
he would create these things he referred to as um, the atlas. So he was using images that were direct references for his paintings, but also news clippings and things that were happening around the time that he was making his work. So it's like a full um, historical document, really. And um, I love looking at the way something is presented where like all of these things are equal. You know, this direct influence of, of what is around you, what's affecting you politically at home, you know, your walk on the way here um, will, will be the reason you created um, whatever you're making. Uh, Joseph Kasuth, I don't know if I've always pronounced that wrong, um, who was in this kind of same world as Magritte talking about like de the delivery and presentation. So we're looking at, you know, a photograph of a chair next to a chair, next to the definition of a chair. But really, we're looking at a photograph of all this stuff. But that's like a meta moment. Um, and we question how we actually understand language. Um, and I feel like I tend to love the installations that people are like, oh, this is, this is stupid. What is this? It's a chair. It's a picture of a chair. I get it. Um, I once saw an install that was a, um, a tape measure just painted on the wall. And that's, I mean, my life as an installer, it's like, oh, I would love that. If that could just like, I just like slide that down the wall with me, people are like, that's stupid. But it's, it's a very specific language. And I think that that's the exciting thing where it's like, we're not all going to get the same jokes, but I love and appreciate this joke, uh, which brings me back to Dwayne Michaels, this I think about thinking. Um, so my last three college classes were, um, I worked with the teacher, Trish Newmeyer, who um, let me work in her darkroom. She like left for a summer and she gave me the keys to her darkroom, which was really special. Um, and I made cyanotypes in there and she still teases me that I got blue drips on her floor. Um, and Molly Lamb's class again, uh, which was a portfolio class. And I realized I enjoyed the sequen sequencing of images uh, more than anything else. So I was in a class where it was a portfolio where people would come in with, you know, 50 to 100 pictures and you needed 25, right, to put it in a story. And um, that's often how we have to like summarize a body of work for y an initial output to someone. So like these portfolio reviews we, that we do that I'll mention a little bit later. It's like some, you know, what do you want to say in 25 pictures? And I felt like I had a good grasp on that, especially for other people's work more than my, more than my own. Um, and then this, oh yeah, I should have cropped this a little bit. Um, <laughs> this is my fucking desktop. It's clean today. Um, so my final assignment in college was probably my worst failure of an assignment. Um, this class was called Deconstructing the, the Delivery. So it was all about how we're going to show this final like thesis piece. Um, so this mannequin, I had took it from my boyfriend at the time's house. He lived with like seven dudes and it had all um, she was written all over and there were stickers and um, this thing was completely mistreated and like on a pedestal in the middle of the of their TV room. So one night I took her and I brought it home with me and the kids it still gives me a hard time about it but I still have her. Um, oh. <laughs> and um, I cleaned her up. So I made this you know semester long project about cleaning up this body and like what it meant to to, to have this, this purity um, again. And you know, I involved my boyfriend at the time to like make marks on it and he drew a necklace that was like my necklace. And I was like, oh, what are you doing? You know, and it was, a, it was a really complex project for me. I didn't really know what I was in for kind of um, addressing these, especially at home on such a personal level. Um, so anyway, deconstructing and delivery, final, final day of class and I had this video ready to go, and it was major importance for me. And then I had my mouse hovering over the play button. So it came up differently where the file name was like right above the play. And I named it this stupid thing that was like dun, 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 dun. And during the presentation of it, you could see this file name the whole time. And it's like that, it, ru it ruined it. Um, and I think about this now and it's like, oh, if only I could catch up with myself in that moment and be like, oh, that was the whole thing. You know, it's like subtitles when you, you can't look away from the subtitles because there's this text again, this captioning that is forcing your attention. 
Um, so I finally get it. You know, I messed this up, and I could have I could have really spun it in a in a way. But I think it's um, it's kind of funny to look at this now, where you know it's like a successful a successful whatever that means today um, career in photography. My last assignment was actually that I I fucked it up. Um, so at this time, I I started interning at the Griffin Museum. Um, but right after school, I made I made a few new pictures that were, you know, I was fresh out of college and it was this life outside of being a student for the first time and I was um, cohabitating with somebody and I was 20 years old. Um, so a few of these pictures that, you know, I, I still love uh, made during that time. Um, now would you get to the Griffin, which <laughs> was really hard to simplify into a few slides because it was almost seven years of my life. Um, I often refer to it as my graduate program because um, it was so much information packed into a condensed period of time. It was like, here is the deep end, um, and I felt really willing to jump right in. Um, so I'm not like a, a super believer in luck as I am to showing up for stuff, right? So to be in the right place at the right time, you actually have to go to the thing sometimes. Um, and so I was an intern there, and I was holding down the fort on a Friday afternoon and Paula approached me and she was like, how do you feel about taking Meredith's job? And I was like, well, I was like, shit. I was like, I didn't know she was leaving. I was like, I graduate next Friday. So I started right away. I started literally two days after college ended. Um, and Paula at the time had lost her partner like two weeks before. And the woman whose position I took had left, not, not dramatically, but she was unreachable. Um, so I told Paula as I was leaving the Griffin actually that my first couple weeks I would fake type because we could hear each other but we couldn't see each other and I didn't know what to do and I was scared to ask questions. I, I went from intern to associate director and I was like, oh God, and I would literally make fake key sounds being like, oh, you have this fancy title, like, look at you, wish you knew what you were doing. Um, so that's how a lot of jobs start. I mean, I was 20 years old, um, but you're presented with challenges, and that's really the best way to learn. Um, so I think internships and jobs at a young age or whenever you can get involved, internships especially because I knew I wanted to be here too, which was really lucky for me. Um, so my first task was to take down a juried show, which was typically... Um, oh, I hate that you can see the wood on the top of these things, but whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, it was typically about like 60 people, and I had to return all of their work to them, right? And I, it was like my first week. Oh, God. Um, and I had never made a FedEx shipping label in my life. Um, so I had to, reach out a, a lot to well, I had to reach out to a lot of people to try to figure out how to get their stuff back to them. And everybody was like really generous and understanding. And that was the beginning that I was like, Oh, we're just all people. <laughs> um, and about learning how to find the right person when you need to ask for something. Um, and so I met, I met hundreds of photographers and shippers and people who make these movements happen, and it, it became a thread in my entire life. There were so many shows I wanted to like go through a bunch of artists that really made an impact to me throughout this whole thing, but it, it's like really like 700 people. Um, we had four, three galleries at the main museum and then four rotating galleries. So a lot of, it was me and this guy, Frank Tadley, <coughs> who would do the installations. And so I got really pretty quick and precise with these installs. Um, and I think about, you know, it's the classes that you took when you were young, like if I, told my whatever grade t algebra teacher, Mr. Mon, that I use algebra every day, I would f feel like I was lying to him um, at the time, but I really do. Um, and a lot of this job, a lot of my job now is really administrative. Um, so finding the processes in order to get all of these people organized. You know, it's a really um, glamorous sounding job where you're putting on exhibitions all the time, but really how much paperwork goes into that. Um, is absolutely insane. Um, 
and I'm an admittedly a binder person who I, you know, I'm, I'm killing trees, I'm sorry, but I have to have everything printed, I have to look at, I have to check physical things off or otherwise it didn't happen. So this is, these were the three galleries at the main museum, um, the main one, the middle one, and this, the small little precious one. And the building itself, I don't, I don't have a full picture, but um, it was the quaintest place. Um, it was on a river, you know, it was this old um, building that was made to resemble a Grist Miller's home. It was lovely. Um, but there was a lot of aspects of the job I didn't expect, like managing summer camps and the parents of those students who we were scared we would offend by these pictures on the wall, which was like sacrilegious for me to do something like this, to managing wedding rentals and like wiggling out of conversations of people asking me what color their linen should be. It's like, do, do not. Do not involve me here, but this is, it was a nonprofit, right? So you, um, it, a lot of, a lot of this kind of stuff came up, um, board meetings and fundraisers and just regular committee meetings at almost every single night of the week. Um, managing, this was the first year I worked with a new roof installation and how we would pay for it. Um, and the town meetings associated with that. So it was, you really get, fully involved in an organization when you are a staff of two and a woman on the weekends. Um, and all of like the love and the heart and the time that goes into uh, a space like this, like a brick and mortar space also. Um, but the most important thing I learned from the Griffin was the community aspect of it and bringing in a sh and pieces like this is, uh, we had a juried show each year which I met so many wonderful people um, but oftentimes we were tasked with building uh, this, the story from, typically it was other people's selections, but they wouldn't do the layout. Um, so I really learned the magic of it from, Paula was a wizard at, at this uh, arrangement of things. And I, I really learned more about reading artwork. Um, so I went to a bazillion exhibitions, um, events, festivals, lectures, and I was involved um, in a lot of the courses that we put on at the Griffin. It was a very educational and supportive atmosphere. Um, and, but that really just is, stresses the importance of um, showing up to things. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few of my favorite shows that we did there that I, I think about all the time. Um, so this, we presented the artwork of David Prifty, who was, he was an educator in Concord, Massachusetts, but he had passed away maybe a year before we put on this show. Um, but we worked in his studio and we recreated that wall in the gallery space. So we made this big ass print of, sorry for the language, um, of the, the wall and then we hung some of the physical pieces on it so we didn't want to dismantle his whole space. Um, but we brought this, this workshop into, into the Griffin's space. Um, and after this, I had worked with his wife, um, Monica Anderson, who is a wonderful artist in her, in her own world too. Um, but I helped her inventory the rest of the works that were in the house. So she had lost him tragically and she was trying to put all this together. And you don't want to be measuring you know, pieces of scrap metal <laughs> when, when, you're, when you're grieving. Um, so I wanted to help her in any way I could. And this was like a moment where um, I felt the real careness the care and the awareness of preserving uh, an artist's legacy. Um, whew, love them every day. Barbara Crane, um, such a powerhouse. Uh, she was working, you know, the peak of her career was um, time when photography is really a man's medium. Um, and she made a name for herself commercially as well as in a fine art context. And um, a lot of her pictures were really abstract. And I remember she came to the opening, it was like a full retrospective in, the, in that main room. And a few of the pieces were hung upside down. <laughs> and she was so gracious about it. And she was like, she's like, oh, that one's upside down too. And I was just like, luckily there were Nielsen frames, I could just flip them over. Um, not these, but some more that were more still life. And this was the, one of the best experiences I ever had. So it was like, Barbara Crane is you know, a huge deal, but really she's human and she's hilarious. And her husband was there being like, oh, Barbara keeps this weird stuff in the freezer. She like, keeps my cat's hairball so she could photograph it later. <laughs> it's like, you know, that's, you know, you live with an artist and there's um, uh, just these funny stories. So this is from Private Views too, which 
I think it's just, God, one of the sexiest projects in the world. Um, and a lot of her pictures reference early moments in film. Like, so this is the Lemire Brothers um, early film of workers leaving the factory. And she had this project of uh, people of the North Portal in Chicago. And I wish I included a few more of these, but it's a beautiful array of images that show this, this uh, diverse demographic of this area in Chicago. Um, uh, another artist that really changed my life, uh, Patrick Nakatani, who uh, was working in Polaroid also. Both of these shows, Barbara Crane and Patrick's, were put on uh, with Barbara Hitchcock, who is a curator of the Polaroid collection and on our board and like full on top, one of the coolest people I've ever known in my life. Um, but he was making these strong statements about like nuclear warfare and um, I don't have a picture of the, the internment camps, but referencing history that I didn't learn about internment camps in high school. And I think about that a lot where it's like, you know, we're t it keeps coming back to this, like this history, this caption, this information that's given with pictures. And if the victor's writing history, we're embarrassed about that time. So we're not gonna tell, we're not gonna talk about it. Um, but Patrick, uh, referenced a lot of that stuff and um, was was also really playful in his his process. So this is made out of all masking tape, different colored layers of masking tape. Um, he's using a photograph as the as the base of it. Um, but anyway, these excavations that you know this is under Stonehenge. Um, who knows that that car is there? But like again with the the captioning idea, um, and he was so experimental and. Um, he had this incredible sense of humor. Uh, we had an Ernest Withers show that I put in in case Bill Chapman came. Daryl, really can tell him this was in it. Um, and then to winter member shows where we had a, you know, like a free-for-all kind of show where, hey, you're a member of the Griffin, send your picture. Uh, so this was like one of my biggest challenges every year to, um, to like puzzle this, this um, show together. Um, okay, I just want to play this because I found it on my camera roll and it just really speaks to um, the nurturing of people and how many different personalities you have to interact with on a daily basis. At 3.32 p.m. Hi, my darling. This is Irma Spencer calling. My God, I know soon I got home, I got your sweet note. You just do get things done. You're a sweetheart. Oh, I had the best time with you. I look forward to seeing you again, and it's going to be sooner than you think. I got the lights and the lens package. I had to make a custom size box for shipping. So really, this voicemail is about shipping, right? Which I, shipping is like the, a humongous part of my life. Um, and it is my literal every day in these jobs that I've had. Um, so I thought that was kind of nice because it's about the, the, the caretaking of these people. She was donating something to the museum and we just had this rapport that was, became really loving. So Paula also really encouraged me to do some writing, which I'm really grateful for. Um, so this was, as earlier mentioned, uh, Don't Take Pictures. And I interviewed Tara Selios, who I had not met before that time. And she scared the crap out of me. And we later become friends. Um, but it, it was a really early writing assignment. Um, We'll just talk about love for a minute. This was like my photo family that um, adopted, adopted me at that time. Um, and this image is made by Steven Dorado and it was my first night being part of this dinner series that he has, which is an extraordinary project. But I remember he, his, um, his direction for me was to look toward the door as if you're seeing somebody that you're like excited to see and you haven't seen in a long time, which is basically like everybody in this room. So this is the space. Um, but really it's about the love and it's about the it's spending time and learning about people's processes. Um, so this is an event at the Griffin Museum with the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence who do a lot of good um, uh, philanthrop philanthropic work. I could never say that word. But anyway, love and light. This, one, this picture cracks me up because I was really nervous to do this judging with this show. It was like two established, you know, um, Boston photographers. And on my way there, I was like really nervous. I was like, nobody's gonna take me seriously. And then I get in there and I'm like, I realize my opinions are fully intact and were worthy of being heard in this space. So this just makes, it makes me laugh because it's like I can hear my own voice in here and it's like suddenly shaking up um, 
this conversation. Um, um, this, uh, okay, so a lot of the time at the Griffin, I didn't make my own pictures for quite a while because I was dealing with everybody else's pictures and I feel like that's a, a good thing to admit. Um, and I felt, I feel like uh, it's a common casualty that creative can be, creative, creativity can be stifled by too much work and I'm still working on that balance. But these were made um, at a really difficult time in my life and um, that's typically when we decide to make pictures and like how I look at these now and I'm tasked with the responsibility of being honest about things and it's, um, we expect artists to be open and willing to share these deep um, confessions, you know, back to these post-secret things. Um, but what if I started revisiting this work and, you know, put a caption on here that says I'm pregnant and the more information about these, like if there is a person's name or a relationship who is on the other side of this Polaroid. Um, so I feel like I'm walking this balance of working in this professional arena where we're talking about other people's work and I'm scared to expose some of my own personal issues and challenges um, of, of being a human being and an artist that's in a sort of public sphere. Um, so this is kind of the end of my time in Boston where I had a show with two of my teachers, uh, Molly on the left who came up a few times, um, and Rachel Lowischild who organized it. Um, this is me and Paula, she threw me a party when I left the museum, which was a really nice thing to do because it was a quick two week turnaround. Um, and with Bruce Silverstein, I had applied, I think five different times to different roles there. I like very specifically wanted to work in this space with the history of photography. I mean, every day I, s I get excited what's um, in those drawers and coming in and out. Um, and I finally got hired. I remember he called me, uh, Liam, the director at the time, he was like, you're kind of like a wild card. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm into that. Um, but I was hired as the registrar and with the promise uh, that I was a good installer. So this was my last install at the Griffin that was really hard for me. So I, this took me forever because I didn't realize you had to start from the bottom because all of them have cleats and they have to you know, be hung from the top. Um, so thank God I had this because my first install at <laughs> with Bruce was a pad when it was still in the armory, which was beautiful. But I had Penelope Umbrico's embarrassing books, they're called. Um, and they all, they had to be hung in the same exact way. So I was like, oh, yes. Like I feel, you know, I got to show up and be like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. And I, it didn't take me five hours like this one did. Um, so it all, you know, it, all of these, all of these skills, um, overlap and they, you know, they come into your life and you, you make mistakes and that's, you know, that's the saying you always learn from them. Um, so then my, like one of my early, early things to do with the gallery was to catalog um, Alfred Stieglitz equivalents, which are little moments of magic um, and their photo history. You know, we could talk a lot of shit about Stieglitz, but he also, you know, was a humongous, um, important person for photography being considered an art. Um, so I had to go back to Boston real quick and get like a, oh, it was like a minor surgery, but I had anesthesia and I came back and I cataloged these prints and I never had really done this before, you know, just like the, you know, it's, it's flush mounted and then mounted again to paper and then like how you just word that, I had never really had to do that before. Um, so I messed a bunch of these up and it reminds me of this Jenny Holzer quote, um, there is a period when it's clear that you have gone wrong, but you continue. Sometimes there is a luxurious amount of time before anything bad happens. <laughs> so I had messed up a lot of these cataloging, these cataloging um, records, and nobody really knew until we had a show where we were putting together the price list, and I was like, oh, these numbers don't really <laughs> match up, and, um, but it was okay, you know, I, nobody, nobody got hurt in the process, but, um, this was the show that it was part of, which is called Songs in the Sky, which was um, pairing uh, musical influence with um, photographers. I don't have the equivalents in here, but we have uh, Siskin's Pleasures and Terrors and Lizette Modell's uh, Shadows in the Street. Um, okay, so then the next uh, full exhibition that we put on was Paul Outerbridge, which was absolutely divine. Um, but this was my first experience with communicating with 
um, consigners, these like high level consigners that were, you know, lending these works out of the goodness of their heart. Um, so a lot of them weren't for sale, they were just coming from collections and I always, I always love that too and like, you know, you're in museums, people are lending and it's, it's like, oh, here's something I love but I'm going to share it with you. Um, so my heart is really in the, in the museum <laughs> world. But I learned a lot about etiquette. You know, I came from a place where everybody called me Francie Pants. You know, I was at the Griffin and it was very casual. It was a, a cool, easy um, way to communicate with people. Um, and I learned uh, this piece of information that I think about all the time. Um, you, you write an email to somebody you don't know, you call them Mr. Miss, um, a proper, a proper um, salutation. And then you don't call them Jack or Barbara until they sign the email Jack or Barbara. And I think about that, I think about that every single day, right? It's just proper etiquette. Um, but these were big, big things for me that I had never really had to deal with um, before. So I learned so much about this job um, was etiquette and really knowing the right person to call. Um, so uh, like international shipments, I call Deb. She's my liaison at SRI. Um, that takes a scary step out of it for me and um, Diana at Le Mans, I can email at 4 in the morning about building a crate and by 9.30 she emails me and she's like, oh, it's fine, you know, like, we got you, Le Mans here. Um, and I know she's, you know, cracking whips on her end and I'm freaking out on mine and, you know, that's, <laughs> sorry, and it's, it's my fault, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, so I have like six minutes left, so I'm just going to go through pictures that I got to touch and I love every single day. Uh, this is a Ringle and Pitt picture, uh, Great Stern, the original Chez Mondrian by Andre Cortez, which we had in the gallery and I worked with the guy who runs the estate and, you know, it was leaving the door and he's like, let me just look at it one more time. I was like, that's the love. Uh, uh, another Cortez, but the back, you know, I was exposed to like the, you know, underneath the mat, what's really under there. Um, this Bill Brandt photo of Juan Moreau that had all of the, the wrinkles drawn in with pencil. Um, Man Ray Macbacchia, Anne Brigman again, uh, Harry Callahan's pic, uh, portraits of Eleanor, um, Marie Cassinda's die transfer print. So here I was, I was exposed to the history of photography in these drawers and it was um, an absolute treat. Rosalind Solomon, badass. Frederick Summer, who um, was exploring all sorts of mixed media, and he was friends with Aaron Siskind. This is um, from his early 1940s project. Um, he was a documentary photographer in Harlem. I love these pictures. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg uh, from Portfolio Print. Baldessari, you know, this was printed on like a clear kind of um, plastic sheet. Uh, Bree Suter is a contemporary artist who's um, living and working, and we're having a show of hers in April at the gallery. Um, and Jane Cunningham, I got to handle these prints and, you know, like when you just freak out and sweat every day when you like see these objects, you know you're, you're doing the right, you're in the right path. Um, Alfred Leslie, who is a living legend, he was an Abax painter uh, turned realist, he worked on Pull My Daisy with Robert Frank. Um, our last show on 24th Street was with Alfred. Um, but when I came to New York, it felt like a little bit cold. Um, you know, the, the galleries weren't hug fests uh, like I was used to, but then um, organizations like ASMP reached out to me to do reviews, and all of a sudden I was back in this like really social um, network of it all. Uh, the Women's Photo Alliance um, is run by Jennifer McClure. Like, I was so nervous to go to this event, and then I showed in, everybody was welcoming and gracious, and um, it was another instance where just really literally showing up made a huge difference. Um, Okay, so these are just, this is a scary picture um, of, no, this one's not scary. Um, this is APAD. This is APAD the next day. Um, <laughs> so I had to go back. We, like, left something, and it's, you know, just look at this. It's all so temporary and, and crazy. Um, so this is, I mean, it's, it's this, this idea of exhibition and everything being proper and lovely and nice is, it's all really quite temporary. Um, uh, this is an install we did of Nathan Lyons who brings it back to that community aspect. You know, he founded the Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester, which is, you know, rich in photographic history and really about uh, people being allies for each other. 
um, which I, I feel a strong presence of that in, in this room, right? Like my friends are here and we're all working together and trying to make um, this medium as accessible and lovely as possible. Uh, this is filter photo, uh, portfolio reviews. I have way too many slides, so I'm just gonna cruise. Um, this was a project, uh, a show put together by my, my dear buddy Elliot Dudick in the middle there and he brought all these photographers. It was his show, but then he was like, I wanna incorporate my friends pictures too. Yeah, there's some, there's some great faces in this photo. Um, okay, so then that, I'm going to cruise right now. Um, the summer of 2017, which was surely the worst year of my life. Um, so here's a picture of my boyfriend who was cheating on me at the time and the like revengeful self-portraits I was making after that. Um, not that it, w it was really going any anywhere, but it, I was angry, and we seem to make the most meaningful work when something is terrible, um, which continues to get worse at this time. So um, my brother passed away in September of that, of that year, and it took like 10 days off of life support for this to happen, and doctors were like shocked that he, he could even like survive that long. So I was there in the hospital with him and my parents who were divorced too, but we were all together in this room. But it was that moment where photography was the only, uh, the only thing I knew how to do. I, did, you know, I could barely talk to them. I just didn't want to talk to the nurses. Everybody's asking you questions and uh, getting in your face. Um, and I just made these pictures. Um, this one, I don't know, it's kind of sweet. We're like getting banged up all the time. Um, so I have one minute left, and um, I jumped back into work really hard after this. I was traveling for art fairs, which was great, but it was also really, really difficult um, doing portfolio reviews, um, but really um, feeling the need to connect with other people and, and what they were feeling and why they were making the work that they were doing. So this brings back like the curatorial um, part of this. That is the most important. Um, I was making pictures that were um, a little messier than I, I had made in the past. Um, and then in the spirit of working too much, I did an online call for entry. And when I was asked what the theme should be, I was like, oh, grief, right? Like I was in the middle of this. I didn't know what to say. Um, but then we got about 70 different entries. Uh, this is Yasmin Melia. She's based in London. Uh, Louise Lazo. Um, this is a, a series about his mother. Molly, again. Um, and then I was able to have an exhibition space in the East Village at Umbrella Arts Gallery. And I was able to bring it into a, a realized space, which, I mean, ultimately, this is the most meaningful exhibition I've put on in my life. Uh, Nina Weinberg Duran's picture, um, Ben Alper. Um, so I feel like I didn't really talk about the, the gallery so much that I'm in now, um, but a big part of what I've been beginning to do besides, you know, paperwork every single day. I'm up to, <laughs> that's the main part of my job. Director of operations means forms. Um, and director of exhibitions means insurance and layouts and framing and I invoices, you know? So it's, it's, um, it sounds really, really fancy and nice, but a lot of it is, is coordination and admin. Um, so this is Dato Mariyama's install at the gallery, which Bruce was like, he's like, I'm, I feel a little overwhelmed by this, please do it. Um, so this was, I got to put my own, my own kind of hang style on this show, which felt appropriate for this work. Um, and then our current show right now is by, uh, photographed by Louis Draper, it's called True Grace. And he's uh, photographing in mostly the, the 60s, early 70s, um, but highlighting, um, highlighting his, his demographic in a really positive light. So the groupings are really important to, to share the story within the subjects. Um, and I, this is a cool show where it's, it's eye-opening. We learn more about it by the visitors that are coming in um, to see it. And they're like, oh, I know this person in the photo. And there was, um, his, he founded the Kamoyge Workshop. And a lot of people are, it's an active, um, like a crit group. Um, so we're meeting a lot of those photographers and we're, we're learning about it as we go, which has uh, been a really beautiful experience. Um, we're going to get back to Magritte real quick. We had a few of these photographs in the gallery and um, it was just reminding me like, 
why and what has brought me into this obsession from the beginning. And it's, um, I went there in December this year too. I was in this backyard where he made these pictures. Um, so it all, um, it all comes back to that and it you know, reminded me of the importance of text. So the work I've been making most recently um, is about uh, social media and our, our accessibility by people in these social formats. Kale and I have talked about this for a, a long time. Um, and it's this aggressive language, it's this possessive language that um, is presented and it's the series is full of commands that we feel compelled to disobey. So it's like it says not to zoom in and you're just like, oh my God, let me see it. So I kind of think of it as a digital project too, which is, you know, my whole life has been about the print. Um, uh, but here's a few examples of these. Um, it's just a scary, like, hmm. post something public or private, and why, and like, where, where it's the boundary. Um, the indication, like, you know, the Great Gatsby, that somebody is like available for you to approach them. So have that green light, um, being left unread, right? <laughs> um, and our act of clearing history, kind of in order to not offend anybody else. A um, few quick things. Shout out to Sarah Russell, inviting me to write the foreword to her book this year. Um, she is a collage artist that was making work in response to uh, the election. And it, they were like these, like these little quiet protests. And um, it, I would recommend seeing, seeing this book. I, I wish I brought it because it's beautifully done. Um, and then let's end with this, um, bringing it back to the fully inclusive nature of this medium. Um, in August, it is the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, granting the women's right to vote, which you know applied to some women at that time. And there's a lot of problems with um, this statement and this celebration. Um, but I'm working with Meg Griffiths, and we've invited over 120 different uh, female identifying artists um, to make work in response to this centennial and it's like growing beyond us and it's so exciting, but this is like where it comes back, um, comes back home for me of making it a, 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 community, a, a community project and you know, the core of what I care about and it's <laughs> this mode, I'm in this place where it's like, I'm, a, I'm truly accepting this as my passion and it's like everything you'll do will be working toward the greater understanding of what you love the most. So, it's about love. <laughs> the end. Okay. There you go. Thank you, Francis. Oh my god, thank you, Ephraim. Um, uh, I don't know how many students are in here, but I'm gonna ask like a, um, I think when you're in school, you it's very easy to get locked into, I wanna be an artist, mm -hmm. right when I graduate, right? which I've heard a lot of people, and I think it's a good piece of advice to stamp that idea out <laughs> immediately is a good idea. Um, so I would want, with how many artists you've worked with and how much work you look at, what do you think a good, more achievable goal? Let's mortalize them a little bit. Yeah, well, I think finding um, what you can apply to a day job, like I'm a good admin person, I, you know? Um, I think, the idea of being an artist, it's this kind of, especially when you're in school, it's this idea, it's this achie achievable thing where you're gonna be a fine artist. Um, and so much of like the marketing of yourself and the networking is, is kind of left out of that conversation. So I think it's like really identifying your, your skills, your applicable skills that you could carry on and make the artwork that you truly care about. So if you're, if you find a way to have income and support your life by working in the art somehow, um, it'll give you a little bit more freedom to make the pictures you want. Like, I'm not making my pictures for anybody else except me. And, but I'm also not trying to survive off of them in any sort of way or even show too many people. Um, but realizing like what your strengths could be. Like, I'm an installer, that's why I got hired with Bruce. It's because I can hang a picture, I can hang 70 pictures perfectly straight. Um, but that's, that's real, that's my trade. Um, and it's, it sounds kind of like a downer thing, but um, it's real as well. that's right. I, gu I guess what also more specifically what I meant, sorry, okay. I wasn't, um, 
but also to like sort of achieve those goals of like uh, sure you're not going to get represented by like Bruce Silverstein isn't going to come knocking on, on our doors when we first graduate but what's a more achievable goal to pursue those fine art aspirations yeah I mean I, f I feel like even the Griffin was a wonderful um, w a nurturing space for that too where they have juried shows they have um, workshops and things and it's getting back it's getting back into a, a kind of a classroom setting in that way. Um, but doing these portfolio reviews, um, ASMP offers them, hopefully pretty cheap, I think, too. But it's um, sharing your work with people who have the capacity to put it in a magazine, to write a review about it, to put, I mean, you're doing these amazing group shows, too. And it's like, I'm not, some of them are call for entry. Some of them are people you've met along the way. Um, but it's, I mean, Seeing, I feel like um, Lens Scratch is a really good um, source for finding call for entries and different things that you could get involved in um, and just sharing your work. Um, and it comes back to really showing up, right? Like nobody's going to know who you are if you don't go to a thing. Um, so how we've met artists that we represent um, now, you know, we take on very few new artists at the gallery. Um, but a lot of those relationships have been nurtured for a long time. And a lot of these people are, you know, in their 50s and above that are getting new representation. So it could seem like a frustrating um, goal to try to achieve, but it's a process and it's building those relations, relationships over a long period of time. Like, so maybe I'll have a gallery or something someday. And it's like, my, you know, they're the first ones to be shown in there. Um, but that's, that's it. It's the it's the nurturing of it. I don't know if that answers that any better. Okay. All right, I'm just I wanna go to a permanent picture. I have this saved for last. I knew Lou Draper, the the artist that's there back <coughs> unfortunately when he passed away too young. Um, and I'm just curious because that was he passed away I believe like twenty five years ago, correct? He passed or away in two thousand six. Oh, okay, but still, he was pretty obscure until, how did this happen? I'm curious how that came about, because I do love his work, but his fan base was very m small, so yeah, I'm just curious about yeah. that. Yeah, um, so actually, so I wish I really knew how Steve connected with him. I think through um, Gordon Stentinius in Richmond, so Lou Draper was from Richmond originally, um, and his sister is still there, and the archive is there. Um, and uh, Gordon, who is with Candela, uh, they make books, but it's also an exhibition space. Um, he connected with the family, and then he was shown with Steve Kasher, Stephen Kasher, um, before he closed down a couple years ago. So, um, you know, th there's just like overlap in this gallery world, but we, we, Bruce went down and met the sister, and he, he got those prints back up here. Um, and we were working closely with the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, who has uh, a bit of his archive as well. So it was multiple connections, like from from his hometown. Um, so it's working directly with the family. That's that's how he got them. And I'm, I, it's he was so well loved, too. And there's a lot of students that have been coming to the show, other uh, workshop members, and you know, like I said, I was like, we're learning more about this artist every day from the people that are coming to it. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen the show yet? Yeah. OK. It's up for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hi. Um, so I just wondered, since you're coming from this interesting perspective of having worked with Griffin, which I think is nonprofit, yep. and then a commercial gallery, and dovetailing that with portfolio reviews, how do you see like the overview of the way that artists um, connect with places, not just necessarily for Bruce Silverstein, but mm -hmm. the direction that the art world may be going in regarding portfolio reviews versus um, other ways that artists are able to connect with um, people that might be interested in their, in their work? Yeah, um, there's a common issue with portfolio reviews because they're expensive and you have to travel to get to them. And a lot of the times, you know, you're seeing a lot of the same people because these are the people who can afford to go. So they are really lovely in a lot of ways and are really problematic in others. Um, so that is actually something I think about a lot. Um, the last portfolio review I was at, 
somebody asked me, they're like, well, when are you going to open your own gallery? And I was like, well, I was like, maybe when I find a different model that is a bit more supportive. Because right now, trying to um, go in this same way where you have to have this brick and mortar space with these perfectly framed prints and everything gets really expensive. So you're not going to be seeing um, this wealth of work that exists in the world. And I actually feel I'm, I'm in a position now where I, I'm not seeing as much as work as I used to, like at the Griffin, um, where we had um, a lot of different outlets for people to share work and it wasn't so um, expensive. So there's a few things like even the Women's Photo Alliance is putting together these kind of crit groups, right? And I feel like that's a really um, strong organization, even though it's truly just like a Facebook group. But it's these connections that are being built in this really kind of magical way and is providing a space um, to share work. And I think maybe that's like something we should talk about going forward is having uh, um, nights where you share work and there's people from all different facets of the industry there. Um, so I don't really have a great answer for you. Um, Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, how that reduces the visibility of like artists sort of making it through right. to, you know, the, the places that would have that impact. Right, and it's this common issue of like how we digest imagery so differently on a, on a computer as we do in real life, like to go to a gallery or a museum and see prints in real life and how, how they're presented to you is such, um, is such an important part of the, d the, of the delivery of all of this. So how like scrolling really affects our way of, of learning and digesting is, um, I think we're at a tricky crossroads right now of how we're presented with art and um, how we are gonna tend to see the same thing over and over again if we continue in that format. Um, it's kind of scary, but I would love to work to find a bit of resolution to that. Yeah. Does, does your work uh, curating independently show you a, a new way of doing things in, well, in that same manner of looking for alternative models or alter alternative uh, business models? Yeah, well the thing with that, like to curate independently too, like I paid for that space, you know, and I, um, it's, you have to have the, the uh, space to do something um, and the freedom to do something. Um, we're often compi uh, confined to a uh, call for entry, a theme or something. Um, but the independent curation is really exciting, um, but it's, it's hard to make that a reality too. It, um, that, whole, that whole project that I put up at Umbrella, Fact, Umbrella Arts was so stressful and so expensive for me to do. And it was like, it was, you know, compounded with like the, the meaningful aspects of it, but, um, I couldn't afford to do that again, at least for a couple years. Um, so it's <sighs> like I, you know, um, I. A work in progress. Uh, yeah, and I think about sometimes if I had, you know, like, do we do we make blogs anymore? Magazines, you know, PDN just closed, and like just like the whole think of the whole history of that publication just in itself. It started off what he would you know drop pamphlets out, like five-page printouts at camera stores, you know, and then it grew to this, this beautiful publication. And then, you know, we saw it, um, we watched it go down the past couple years, and it was, it was really sad because it used to be um, such a big resource for, in terms of fine art and the, the technical aspect of things. So it gets depressing when you think about it. <laughs> But maybe on a different note, do you have an exciting independent project that you're working um, on, even if the space hasn't been resolved yeah, or the budget yeah, hasn't so been Yeah, so um, this down. Yellow Rose project that I mentioned right at the end um, is it's a political topic. Um, and we, Meg and I, she's better, I feel like she's a, a bit better at like the fundraising and the, <laughs> the getting people's attention with these kind of things before it even actually exists. We don't even have the images yet. Um, but we have a space offered to us in October in Colorado at um, 
an arts organization. So you know now we have to find all the funding for it. Um, but it's really exciting that you know specific topics. I feel like people are, are willing to um, to fund or put put their resources out on the line. Um, so I'm really excited about that, and it's growing so fast beyond us. You know, we both have like basically three jobs each, and we're, we're getting home around the phone in the middle of the night like, how do we do this? We need to change the thing on the website. Do you have the color code? Can we afford this logo? Um, but it feels really exciting, and it's coming from um, a, a really sincere place of wanting to uh, band together and make this happen. But it's, you know, it's, it's asking people, too, which is not always, not always easy to do, but it's exciting. <laughs> I'll take them. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to monopolize questions, but so another question is: um, um, Do you see it? Every every gallery sometimes has their own, like a brand, like a certain type of work that, and so which could be a good thing or, or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if um, you see a certain type of work, trends, and so forth. Um, overall, despite the fact that maybe your gallery maybe encourages certain types of work versus other galleries. Um, but in general, do you see certain uh, types of photographic work um, that's really becoming more important or more interesting or more in the, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, are you, like what, I guess I'm asking what trends you're, I guess I'm asking what, I guess I'm asking what photographic trends you're seeing. So that's all. Sure. Um, actually, it's, it kind of ties right back into uh, Louis Draper, um, who is an African-American artist. And for a long time, um, these works were not being collected. Um, so Lou Draper were getting a lot of museum interest in. And right next door, Davis Werner just had a Roy de Carava show, which five years ago, I feel like wouldn't, would, <laughs> wouldn't have been uh, something that he, he would, would go for. So looking at like the market of things is, um, you know, museums and institutions are kind of making up for mistakes in the past, which I'm, you know, we're directly working with now. Um, and I, th I think that's going to change, you know, um, which museum is collecting only female artists for the next year. This was like a post that went, went viral for a minute. It's like, well, yeah, it's like, well, you didn't do it for the whole history of the organization, so now you're doing this, like, great job. Um, but, you know, so, th like, that's, that's trends in, like, a very um, a, a specific statement. Um, but I am I'm trying to make a case with Bruce, too, of having a show this summer or sometime um, soon that's really incorporating the historical elements of our inventory and what we have and then people who are actively making work. And we don't have to, you don't have to represent somebody all the time, but to include one piece in a show could be a really big deal for somebody. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of these galleries have been run by the same people for a really long time, and it's starting to shake up a little bit as people retire and, and grow. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for new voices and people to come in and look at it as more of a, a community effort than, um, you know, just identifying the masters and this print sold for X amount of dollars in 2014, so it should be worth this much now. Like, my, my role in this corporate or this um, commercial kind of setting, it, that's like, that's what hurts me, right? Where it's like, you look, it's like, oh, this appreciated that much. It's like, okay, great, but like, what, what does it make you feel? Um, and I think we need to get back to that conversation is, is, I guess, the goal of the rest of um, what I see in this field for, for me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.